And those redox dynamics are going to affect cycling of sulfur, of iron, of nutrients, carbon, etc. And so in this work, one of the, oh, so one thing we wanted to quantify in this work and why hopefully it's relevant to those of you working on SGD is the horizontal flux of carbon between the marsh platform and the tidal channel. So um, movement of dissolved inorganic carbon and dissolved organic carbon between uh, the marsh and the channel, which eventually would make its way out to the ocean. <clears throat> the other thing we're interested in is the vertical flux. So production uh, of carbon dioxide in the sediments making its way up into the atmosphere or, or the opposite, the CO2 being um, uh, the CO2 flux into the marsh. And one of the important biogeochemical processes at play here is carbon oxidation. And I'm showing aerobic carbon oxidation here. So organic matter that's abundant in these marsh sediments um, in the presence of oxygen will be converted to CO2. Okay, and so that's one of the major processes that's gonna determine both the concentration of the DIC in the water that's exchanging, as well as the amount of carbon dioxide that can, that can move into the atmosphere. So this is our field site. You can see that, so this is the marsh, and you can see that it's, it's right up against um, agricultural fields, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And we have um, a fair amount of instrumentation. We have shallow and deep, monitoring wells, um, we have uh, instrumentation in the channels, we also have these, these um, green dots are SEPs, so measurements of marsh surface elevation, etc. And Julia and others in the group did a lot of work, and I'll just kind of give a sense of some of the field work that they did here. So for the hydrology, here's Julia. Um, doing slug tests, which she conducted in our wells. So we have monitoring wells fitted with data loggers. Um, here are piezometers measuring hydraulic gradients between the channel and the marsh. Um, seepage meters for direct measurement of groundwater discharge into the tidal channel. And then she also did some biology and geochemistry. So pretty early on, Julia noticed that the marsh crabs, the fiddler crabs, played a big role in um, in the system. And so she did counts of these macropores and she also um, did plaster of Paris casts in the burrows to understand uh, their extent. And um, she measured DOC and DIC in pore water. And she also used multi-depth redox sensors. So these are platinum electrodes uh, placed at different depths along um, this fiberglass rod into the marsh sediment so she could get continuous measurements of relative redox potential. Okay, so um, thinking about, so this is just a schematic now again of our marsh platform here. Here's the tidal channel. And we have ecological zonations in our, in our marshes, you know, all marshes. Um, and those ecological zonations, the vegetation zonations, tend to correspond with hydrological zonations. So here are some measurements made in different zones within our marsh. Um, so this, the y-axis here is the water table elevation, and this is time. The dashed line here is the marsh surface elevation. So you can see the, the water level in the well changing tidally. And uh, during spring tides or during high tides, it overtops the marsh surface. Um, and in the higher elevation zone, we call that this we call that the near creek zone. It's diurnally inundated twice a, twice a day usually um, during high tide. The periodically inundated zone is only inundated on a spring neap cycle. So during the spring tides. Um, and most of the time it's it's unsaturated, the water table is below sea low, or below the marsh surface. And then in the interior, which is away from the tidal channel but lower elevation, it's almost always saturated. So the water level uh, varies tidally, but it's it's almost always above the marsh surface. And then we have the upland. Um, so uh, thinking of, looking in each of those hydrologic zones, Julia made measurements of, uh, what of what we plotted here is the number of burrows per unit area over 
a year over time. And you can see that the number of burrows really increases during the summer when these crabs are active, um, but primarily in the Near Creek zone. So most of the burrows are in that, in that area near the tidal channel. And that translates into a big increase in the hydraulic conductivity as well as the groundwater discharge rate. So um, this is hydraulic conductivity, the, that's these dots and lines um, over again a year and the gray bars here represent the seepage meter measurements. And so you can see that particularly in the Near Creek zone, the hydraulic conductivity increases by uh, a factor of 10 approximately, and the seepage meters also show a substantial increase in uh, the groundwater discharge to the tidal channel. So the, there's a spatial and temporal nature to these crab burrows that affects the hydraulic conductivity, so the amount of water that can move through these generally low permeability marsh sediments. And so we see that there is a increase in groundwater flow into the creek during the summer. And there is a, and so we can look at both the flux as measured by seepage meters and, and by hydraulic gradients, and also the concentration of dissolved inorganic and organic carbon in the water to estimate the uh, horizontal carbon flux between the marsh and the tidal creek. And so what we're showing here are um, just three different ways to estimate the water flux combined in this case with dissolved inorganic carbon concentration to show how the fluxes of inorganic carbon uh, increase dramatically during the summer. So in the summer there's about a 10 times increase in groundwater flux a 50 times increase in dissolved inorganic carbon flux and a net positive DOC flux, uh, whereas it's negative in the winter. Okay, so, uh, so far the linkages are the crabs are increasing the hydraulic conductivity, which enhances the groundwater surface water interactions and increases that horizontal flux of carbon from the marsh to the channel and the ocean. Um, but there are also spatial and temporal changes in redox condition, conditions as measured with these redox probes. So alongside each of these wells that we have in the different zones in the marsh, we also had these multi-level redox probes. And here is some of the data um, that came from those redox probes. So this data is only from the Near Creek zone. I'll show you the other zones in, in a minute. Um, so this, the y-axis is the EH. Um, this is a bit relative, so as, as measured by these sensors, um, but the higher values are more oxidizing, the lower values are more reducing, and the x-axis is time, and we're showing um, several tidal cycles in March, July, and October. The black line is the water level as measured in the well, and you can see it's pretty similar between March, July, and October. And the colored lines are the, um, the EH as measured by the redox probes. The, the colors represent the depths. So this is all along one profile. And blue is the shallowest, then red. So blue and red are in the top 15 centimeters. Um, and then below that are, are green and pink. And the deepest is the yellow. And so what you can see is that in March, really the only zone that's oxidizing is the upper 15 centimeters or so, and below that it becomes very reducing. Um, whereas in July, almost the entire column, except for the 45 centimeter uh, depth, has at least oscillations in which the, the redox conditions become more oxidizing. Whereas in October, again, we're back to similar behavior as March, where only the top, the top 15 centimeters um, is, is um, oxidizing. And so that's important, of course, because where we have oxidizing conditions, the rate of carbon respiration is much higher, right? So particularly in, in the presence of oxygen. So if we think about what the carbon oxidation rate would be down that, that uh, down the column in the marsh, um, it looks something like this. So this is carbon oxidation rate on the x-axis with depth, 
And without burrows, um, the, it, it drops pretty quickly, the rate of carbon oxidation drops pretty quickly to a depth of about 10 centimeters, whereas with burrows, the oxidizing conditions remain much deeper, down to 35 centimeters or so. And that makes a big difference overall to the total amount of carbon that is oxidized. So an estimated 660 millimole per meter squared per day versus about double that in the presence of burrows. Okay, so um, we talked about how the, the biology influences the hydrology and the lateral fluxes, um, but the, the crabs also influence the redox oscillations, which increases the amount of dissolved inorganic carbon in the system, so the CO2, and therefore increases, so that adds, of course, to the horizontal flux because it's dissolved, but also uh, there's um, uh, CO2 gas that is also efflux to the atmosphere. Um, thinking about this more broadly, so this is just in our temperate salt marsh. Um, if we think about marshes globally that are in the habitat range of fiddler crabs, that's the red on this map. Um, and in the blue areas, is the projected future habitat range of fiddler crabs with changes in climate. Um, so overall, just under today's conditions, we, we did a back of the envelope calculation to estimate that crab activity reduces carbon sequestration in marshes by up to say 4% of their total carbon sequestration uh, capacity. But with this increase in, um, in habitat range for the crabs, as well as an increase in their active time, so with warming, they'll be active longer each year, that could about double to about 9% in the next century. So these processes actually could be globally significant um, uh, in terms of the, the carbon sequestration capacity of wetlands in the future. Um, okay, so I showed the, the redox data for the Near Creek, but uh, I want to point out too that not only is, are the redox conditions temporarily variable, but they're also spatially variable according to these hydrologic zonations. So um, again, we have these three zones, Near Creek, Spring Neap, and Interior. And in the Near Creek zone, that's what I showed before, where <clears throat> during the summer, all the way down to 35 centimeters, we're seeing oscillations that result in oxidizing conditions um, all along the, the, the depth of uh, the marsh, down to 35 centimeters. In the spring neap area, the oxidizing conditions are similarly deep, but they uh, persist um, longer during the year because they're not as um, dependent on the crab burrows. Whereas in the interior, only the very top sensor is ever oxidizing, so maybe just the top five centimeters or so. Whereas throughout the year, um, the rest of the column is very much reducing. So that means that, that spatially, the carbon sequestration capacity in the salt marsh is variable. Um, the, the, I think important thing about this is that we're able to tie this carbon sequestration capacity to the hydrology, right? So we can look at the physics of the system and make inferences then about um, the biogeochemical functioning. And so that allows us to use hydrological models to potentially predict how the carbon sequestration capacity of salt marshes could change with relative sea level rise. So what Julia did is, um, let's see how we're doing on time. She um, used hydrogeosphere. So this is a coupled surface subsurface model. Here's her surface mesh and her subsurface mesh. It's three dimensional. It's variably saturated, uh, variable density um, simulations. And here is an example of. Uh oh, this isn't going. Let's see. Hmm. The blue thing should be changing. Hmm. I don't know why it's not working. Sorry. Okay, well, oh, there it goes. Huh. 
Okay, <laughs> so the tide is changing and now you can see that the water depth in the marsh is changing. So these are the tidal channels, right? The water depth is going up and down, but also when you get very high tides, much of the marsh um, tends to flood. So that's what this model is simulating. Um, and so with this model, we can calculate, um, first of all, the groundwater discharge to tidal channels. So Julia looked at several um, scenarios of sea level rise as well as sediment accretion across the marsh and what she showed is that as sea level rises rel as relative sea level rises the amount of discharge into the tidal channels tends to decrease um, one thing that that I think is really interesting is that the upland conditions the water table in the upland actually matters a lot to this process. So, and by that I mean, you know, we can maybe think of this in the context of um, some work that we did a while ago thinking about um, vulnerability to seawater intrusion, but I think it, it actually applies somewhat here as well. Thinking about topography limited systems in which um, the water table is close to land surface. And so if sea level rises, the, the the water table can't rise along with it, right? So extra recharge is just rejected and you end up uh, with a higher sea level and basically the same water table. And um, that's different than in systems that are recharge limited where the water table is, is below land surface. And so as sea level rises, the water table can um, essentially keep pace with that. So if we look at those two scenarios in this model where the upland boundary condition is either held constant with sea level rise or it's allowed to rise with sea level rise, there's actually a pretty big difference or a, somewhat of a difference between um, those two cases in terms of the amount of groundwater discharge into the tidal channel. So if the water table upland is, is able to rise in response to sea level, there's less of a reduction in the amount of exchange, the amount of lateral exchange between the marsh and the tidal channel. Um, the other thing this model let us do was was estimate how those hydrological zonations are going to change with relative sea level rise. So um, we could look at each pixel in this model, look at the hydrological response um, as sea level rises with a fast Fourier transform, for example, compare that to the data we have from these different zones and, um, and then simulate how the area of these marsh zonations will change with relative sea level rise. And so this plot is showing the percent area of each of these zonations. So um, subtitle, uh, the, the title, uh, zonation, spring meet, and saturated and upland. And what you see is that um, as sea level rises, the upland um, is reduced as you would expect. So marshes are migrating into the upland. And another important thing is that some of the marsh is drowning. So we get conversion of the marsh to the subtitle zone. Um, and as we pointed out before, because we can tie these hydrological zonations to redox zonations, we can make estimations for the amount of carbon that would be stored in those zones and, and tie those to these zonations. And so then we can make inferences about how the carbon, carbon accumulation rate of the salt marsh would change in response to relative sea level rise. So um, the, the red is the present day amount of carbon accumulation. And so you can see that with moderate sea level rise, you actually get an increase in the amount of carbon accumulation, but there's a tipping point at which um, with too much sea level rise, it, it starts to decline. And again, there's this interesting effect of the broader hydrologic context where there's a difference um, between a scenario where the upland water table doesn't rise versus when it does rise. So, um, so in this case, if there's no change in sea level rise, it actually kind of moderates the impact on the carbon accumulation rate. Okay, so, um, so what this study so far told us is that there are linkages between the physical, chemical, and ecological ecosystem components. So that, um, and we can make use of those linkages um, in mechanistic models to forecast future change. 
And we also see that these coastal wetland zonation patterns and marsh channel fluxes are dynamically linked to sea level rise, but also the larger, the larger context of the watershed hydrology. And so that highlights the importance of considering the whole system and not just pieces of a system when we're trying to, to forecast future change. So but what we looked at so far was just um, tides superimposed on relative sea level rise. We have not thought about, uh, in this context yet, about episodic events like storm surges. And the other thing that we didn't look at in this scenario is how ecosystem change affects other land sea solute fluxes. So we focused on carbon, but you know, we know that nutrient cycling is really important in these systems as well as uh, you know, transport of other constituents between land and sea. Um, so the, the marsh migration or transition of land ecosystems into wetland ecosystems is um, actually hitting the news quite a bit lately in our region. Um, this is a story from the Washington Post talking about um, farms in North Carolina that are becoming salinized and so this is essentially marsh migration. Um, this is one in, in our local paper, the Delaware News Journal, um, talking about ghost forests. So forests that, you know, former forests that are now, you can see the dead trees that have been overtaken by salt marshes. And so, you know, one side of this is, is that this type of land use change, you know, it, it's, it's not good for farmers, right? And it, 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 you have these stark sort of scars on the landscape. On the other hand, it does indicate that marshes are, you know, able to migrate and won't just drown um, with sea level rise. But, but um, you know, yeah. So this is this is um, something that that I think is is really societally important to understand how these changes are going to occur. So thinking a little bit more about marsh migration, right? So here's our marsh. Here is say our saline groundwater below it. Here's fresh groundwater in the upland. Here's our, our uh, land ecosystem that's transitioning. Um, and to, I'll just illustrate those a little bit more. So here is an example of marshes migrating into forest and marshes migrating into agricultural fields. And what we've talked about so far is the slow processes. Sea level rises, you get flooding, you get intrusion of salt water, and you have a sort of long time scale water response. But another important aspect of marsh, marsh migration are the fast hydrologic processes. So um, periodic high tides, supermoon tides, uh, and storm surges also play an important role in this process. And we can think about it like this. So this is salinity versus time. And this pink zone is the zone where plants become stressed. Uh, so salinity above that point, plants are stressed. Then there are these fast um, uh, hydrologic events that can cause salinization or cause flooding in these systems that put them under stress for a little while, but perhaps the ecosystems can recover. But when you superimpose on that the slow processes, then at some point there is failure of the ecosystem, so forest retreat or crop failure. So it's really the combination of uh, these two timescales of hydrology that are going to control the marsh migration. So I just thought I'd, I'd mention some work that we're doing in both of these ecosystems. Um, here's a, a project we're working on with the US Geological Survey on storm surge salinization and forest mortality. Um, we're working in New York, New Jersey, and Maryland. And uh, my student, Ryan Fredericks, and postdoc, and Air Powder are working on this. Um, there are, are holly forests in New York and New Jersey that are, are um, dying off and in Assateague, Maryland, the issue is infestation of a pine beetle, which they think is exacerbated by salinity stress in these ecosystems. And here they are on Assateague installing uh, wells so that we can monitor and um, model this salinization process. And just to give you a sense of, of um, our models that we're using, hopefully this one will run. Oh no. Hmm. This one's not running either. Uh oh. Okay. Sorry about that. So what this is supposed to show, 
ooh, and I'm running over time, is that you know, we get a storm surge. So this is the surface. Uh, this is, again, hydrogeosphere. So it's coupled surface subsurface. So we have a storm surge in the surface. And so that runs up and runs back down. It's dependent, of course, on the surface morphology. Um, and you get infil infiltration of salt into the system that eventually flushes out. But in this case, it takes five or 10 years to fully flush out. And so we're trying to use models like this to understand um, areas that are vulnerable to either salinization or to flooding. Hmm. Now it's not advancing. Oh, there we go. We're also working along the marsh agriculture transition. This is close to where the salt marsh where we're working. So here's, um, well, actually I'll show you on the map here. So the blue here is salt marsh. The white is Delaware Bay. Um, and you can see the green are center pivots for agricultural fields. So that's right smack up against the marsh. You could also see it in this Google image here. Um, and then we have the city of Dover behind it. This is the city of Dover. The red dots here are the municipal wells for Dover. They're actually in there are some deep wells further back as well. And so we're monitoring salinization of wells and of irrigation ponds in the farms along this transition zone. So there's Chelsea out in the field and the DGS uh, is putting in some wells here. Um, so we're understanding these processes that are causing salinization. Um, Julia also did, let's see if it's gonna run this time. No, still not running, sorry. Um, Julia did some simulations to look at the impacts of marsh migration um, on the salinization process in agricultural fields. So thinking about how allowing marshes to migrate could actually be protective of the fields because of the flood mitigation impacts that they have. Um, so I won't go into all the details, but, but she looked at things like the flood extent beyond the front of the marsh uh, for different storm surges. She also looked at the salinization of the soil and of the groundwater. And she was able to show that Marsh migration, for the most part, protects farmland from surge flooding and from saltwater infiltration and salinization. And then by looking at the impacts of salinity on, on the yield of crops in, in Delaware, corn, corn and soybeans are important crops for us. And so she did an analysis of what, of, of how um, marshes, how marsh migration could potentially protect crops. And she, through a cost-benefit analysis, she showed that um, marsh migration can actually benefit farms while also increasing ecosystem services. So we think this has uh, a lot of implications for policies. Um, and another, some other modeling that we're doing, which is also including uh, more of the upland and thinking about competing uses of groundwater in the system as it relates to salinization processes, we are creating this physics-based model and also coupling it to, um, to behavioral information. So we're, we're collaborating with um, behavioral economists who do experiments to understand how people make decisions around um, uh, common pool resources like groundwater. And so by collecting that kind of data, having a quantitative, quantitative information about how people um, understand the response of the system and how the, they, they make decisions, we can create two-way coupled models between the physical system and the human system to try and better understand how the systems will evolve. Okay, I'm really running out of time. So the last thing, and maybe the thing that's, that's um, more interesting to this group is thinking about the biogeochemical response as the, the marshes migrate. So not only, like I said, are we having changes in the ability of the marsh to sequester carbon, but we can also have mobilization of um, contaminants, we have changes in nutrient cycling, et cetera. And so understanding how the biogeochemistry of these transition zones will change in the future is going to help us predict how the, um, the, the chemical fluxes between land and sea will also change. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, and we actually have a new project that's gonna try and piece a lot of these pieces together, thinking about marsh migration and coastal change, how it's affected by slow and fast hydrological processes, by human response, 
uh, ecological and geomorphological response as well as biogeochemical response. I think what we have to do is link all of these things together to really understand how the coastlines will change and in order to predict how um, changes, predict the changes in chemical cycling in the stores of chemicals in our coastal zones and also fluxes at the land sea margin. So um, these links and feedbacks, just coming back to that, are really key to estimating fluxes and predicting future evolution. And I'll skip what I was gonna talk about, um, about the, the um, offshore work. If you're interested in that, happy to chat later. Uh, and I'll just leave you with this, that, that these interactions are complicated, um, but critical for estimating our fluxes of carbon and other constituents across the land sea margin, like I said. And just thinking even broader, I think um, sustainability of water resources, ecosystems, and oceans is of course a grand challenge for our future. And that incorporates lots of different aspects to these systems. Um, so not, you know, not just our salt marsh hydrology, but all the things that, that uh, play a role in that. And so I think it's critical that we we have interdisciplinary collaborations and we think about engaging stakeholders in the work that we do in order to really try and tackle these grand challenges and this is particularly particularly true as our stresses intensify i will stop there that's great Questions. Thanks so much, Holly. Uh, that was a really insightful talk. So nice to see you trying to, to link yeah, water to carbon and uh, society, I suppose. So uh, yeah, so I'm gonna open up the room for, for questions. Uh, if uh, anybody wants to start, uh, just unmute, uh, ask your question. And if people start lining up, send a quick message uh, via the chat tool on the middle button um, and um, and let's see if anyone has any questions for Holly. We gotta give people 30 seconds, Holly, so they <laughs> they step up. I hope there are questions. Don't there be is shy. no body language, you know, when you do things online. So. <laughs> hey, Holly, this is uh, Ling Yi from Forest State University. Hi. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah. uh, nice. it's a really nice talk and uh, Thank you so much. I have a, just a starting question. So it's the study of the uh, the boros, the crack, uh, crab uh, holes. Uh, that's very interesting. We have a lot of those on our marsh too. Uh, but I see something a little bit different from uh, from Delaware because our crab are alive there all the years, and you okay. see the holes all the year. And, and is that the uh, same thing in uh, Delaware, or how do you know? the change of hydraulic connectivity is, is caused by those crabs. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think, I mean, we, we know that our crabs become dormant during the winter. So when it's cold, they're no longer burrowing. And we can see that just by looking at, um, you know, Julia did those counts of the crab burrows and you could clearly see that in the winter there were much fewer burrows than there were in the summer. Um, and so I imagine that, that this just has to do with differences in climate. So, um, you know, where the crabs are able to be active throughout the year in, in climates like that, then you would have a different kind of, or no temporal variability in the, the crab activity and the hydraulic conductivity. Um, and so in that sense, it would, it would be uh, different. So that would be interesting to look at is the, you know, the activity of crabs in different kinds of systems and, and how that would play a role. Yeah, so we maybe do something similar here and to see <laughs> whether yeah. we see, observe the same thing in Delaware and down in Florida. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Okay, perfect. Huh? Thank you. And if Julie is on, she can chime in too because she's the expert on all of this. I don't know if she's on. Oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. So Other Holly, questions? I have a private message here from uh, from Bill. So Bill, do you want to jump in and ask her a question and then you go to Alicia? Okay. I can hear you, Bill. You can? Yes, yes. 
Okay, good. Holly, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was also wondering about the crab burrows and, and the measurement of the uh, groundwater flux. So if you have more burrows per unit area, that will give you a higher groundwater flux. So would this be a case where using seepage meters may actually give you uh, a better estimate of the groundwater flux than, uh, than say, hydraulic conductivity, Darcy Law kind of measurements? Yeah, that's a great question. So and I'll answer and maybe let Julia chime in too. Um, so uh, yes and no. So, you know, I think seepage meters, if they're working, are generally better because that's a direct measurement, right? So we don't have to estimate the hydraulic conductivity and we don't have to think about yeah, where we're measuring the gradients and things like that. Um, so we did, we did do that. It's not so easy in these systems and I'll let Julia expand on that. Um, but you know, we, by doing the reason, one of the reasons to do the slug test is to get an estimate of the hydraulic conductivity that we could then pair with the hydraulic gradient measurements. And so and I think, you know, overall, if we're, if we're doing a good job of, of measuring the hydraulic conductivity with the slug test, which I think we are, hopefully, um, then I, I think the gradient method is doing just as well in the system as in other systems. Julia, what do you think? Yeah, seepage meters, uh, you know, in theory would be fantastic, but because of the tides and because of the mud uh, and sort of, you know, every step in the mud is, you know, remembered in the system. So you get these pockets and these holes. Uh, we tried a few different things from ladders across the marsh and um, it just is, it's really difficult and you have, at least where we are, these, you know, fairly large tidal oscillations and so um, sometimes the seepage meters are recording but then you have to get the bag out before the water table sort of falls below them um, and so it's not as clean as like a, a lake bed or even a, you know, Beach in the subtitle zone. And you're measuring pretty low fluxes also. It, it looked like they were in the range one to three centimeters per day. Right? Yeah, right. they're low fluxes. Yeah. Not easy. Right. No. Yeah. Very messy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Can I ask a, a follow up question? Uh, sure. Yeah. It's also about the big uh, burrow. It's uh, a little bit crazy. But this is really interesting thing. The the burrow I observe on the on the marsh is really shallow. It's about a one or two inch. We can get them easily. So we think about the scale. That's a very shallow burrow. But we're talking about groundwater down. I don't know how deep it is. It must be several feet. So the, my question is, how does shallow burrow can affect groundwater down several feet, like the slug test that Bill mentioned or Darcy's law? Yeah, so our burrows go deeper than that. Uh, and and Julia was able to show it with her burrow cast. So which when they go at least down to the water table and we don't really know below that because the plaster of Paris doesn't, uh, doesn't stay together below the water table. So our crabs may be again different in that way from yours that their burrowing habit is different. So, uh, and so in that case, you know, I would imagine that there wouldn't be as much of an influence of your crabs to you know, the carbon oxidation in the system or the hydraulic functioning of the system compared to ours. And so, you know, again, I think this, these are things that could really be explored. And, you know, I think there are a lot of things about the system that could be explored. So this is kind of an illustration of, you know, the crabs are important and, you know, the hydrology is important, but also you get macro pores with vegetation, right? So different kinds of vegetation are going to have an impact, different kinds of crabs, other kinds of burrowing organisms. And so I think there are a whole host of things that are still left to be understood about these marsh systems in temperate zones and in, in other climates um, so that we can really better understand the functioning of marsh systems. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Well, maybe I need to go to Delaware to see uh, or invite you to Florida to see Yeah, come, come see our salt marsh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Nami. <Holly. laughs>
Actually, that was one thing I did want to say. I really appreciated seeing the picture of the crab burrow with something for scale, because your crab burrows are bigger than our crab burrows down in the southeastern United States. So that was just really, really good to finally see a picture. We never put them in papers, because like it's a picture of a saw marsh, but in a talk, it's really helpful. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's some really nice work. Thank you for showing it, Holly. Um, my question, and this is a little embarrassing because I've, I've talked with Julia, I've seen the posters, I've read the papers, but I can't remember now um, whether you see large variations in salinity across your salt marsh with the, when you're doing the plant donation across it, because down in where it's warmer, we have a lot of ET and we definitely have hypersaline zones. Do you have any of those there? Julia, you want to answer this? Uh, we have some higher salinity during, you know, August when you have a lot of ET, but not uh, to the extent that you see that you've shown in your papers. Uh, it's more of a brackish system. We don't have sort of those extremes in salinity. Oh, oh yeah. And if you're brackish to start with, it's just a different marsh, really controlled by the hydrology and not nearly as much by the salinity. Yep. Yeah. Ah, okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so I can envision a proposal here, Alicia and Ming, where we compare all these different salt marshes, <laughs> the hydrology and the salinity and the ecology. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to find my, where, here we go. I found it. <laughs> <laughs> we have the group here that could do a worldwide comparison. That would be yeah, really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Holly. I think Pei Ching is raising his hand from China. So, Pei, do you want to jump in? <laughs> do, do you have a question, Pei? Do you want to unmute and ask a question to Holly? Hello, everyone. This is a Hi. very good time. I, I see your crowd work very interesting. How are you, guys? Alec, how are you? Good, Pei. Good to see you. Hey. All right, so I don't think Pei has a question. He just, uh, he was just saying hello. <laughs> well, I don't know, that. Holly, you know, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, the crabs, uh, crabs are affected by temperature, you know, it depends on the temperature, all the activities. So yeah. maybe some work can uh, be linked to uh, global climate change. How do you think? Yeah, well, that, that went into the calculation of, you know, future, um, uh, future changes in carbon fluxes, right? Because mm -hmm. if crab activities become longer, then that, you know, that increases the amount of carbon oxidation. So I think that's an important question. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that plays into sort of what I, the point I was trying to make that we have to kind of understand these whole systems to understand how they'll respond because it's not just that maybe things will become saltier or more frequent flooding, but also that you have changes in the ecosystems due to other factors that are also going to play a role into how these systems respond. Okay, thank you. So Holly, I'm gonna throw a question uh, while the others are thinking. Uh, so you're talking about those feedbacks, right? Um, so groundwater is essentially flushing carbon out of the marsh. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that groundwater presumably um, stimulates primary productivity. So you kind of have groundwater pushing the carbon cycle to you know, different directions. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Have you tried to consider what's the net uh, effect of groundwater on, on those carbon budgets? Hmm. So, okay. So, groundwater fueling primary product productivity in which way? What do you mean? Well, listen, there, there is a series of uh, older papers uh, showing that the groundwater flow, essentially the fresh water is kind of good for mangroves and marshes and that oh, you have yeah. just healthier patches of uh, vegetation where you have kind of fresher groundwater. Um, so I suppose I'm just speculating on how those things may go and what may happen there. Well, in this case, you know, I think that the 
what's what's flushing the carbon out is not the fresh groundwater. It's actually the circulating salt yep. water. So it's the circulation from the channel into the marsh and back out again. And so um, I think those are maybe two different components, right? So if we think about changes in the freshwater input to the system, that's one aspect, but then also changes into the, the cycling and the flushing within the system is another aspect. So if we were going to try and uh, you know, make a whole carbon budget for this whole salt marsh system, I think we would have to include both. But that's not something that I've uh, really thought about. I don't know if, Julia, if you've thought about that component. Yeah, it's not something we looked at in these studies, but definitely thinking about in terms of uh, the importance of this groundwater input so you don't um, you know, get the buildup of sulfur yeah. and starting to think about those feedbacks, but it's not something we've spent a whole lot of time on. Yeah. If I could chime in, I, I think these are actually really interesting questions. We used to always talk about how hydrologists and oceanographers were looking at submarine groundwater discharge from totally different ways. And we had to get hydrologists together with oceanographers to tackle the problem. And now I feel like with salt marshes, the, the salt marsh ecologists think all about what's the primary productivity, but they don't know the groundwater fluxes. Yeah. We are starting to know the groundwater fluxes, but we don't know the primary productivity. Um, they have their carbon flux towers set up. Um, getting the whole budget really is important. And it goes also for the nutrients, where we've been saying for a couple of decades now that salt marshes export nutrients, but we're not really sure how many nutrients are added to the salt marsh. So the, the whole budget of nitrogen and the entire budget of phosphorus is also, I think, um, really hard to say what it is. So this is, I think, some interesting things that we could do. Yeah, I agree. There you go. Uh, anybody else is jumping? Uh, Ling Li, Christian, um, somebody else wants to jump in and uh, throw some questions or comments in the conversation? Everyone is quiet, Holly. Um, shy. People get a bit shy. Um, I'll, I'll throw another question before we close, um, Holly. So you're talking about, uh, you know, Julia was talking about the seepage meters being a challenge, but measuring hydraulic conductivity, I suppose, is quite a challenge as well. How, how are you guys doing that? You showed that big gradient in hydraulic conductivity. Is that slug tests? How do you know that you're measuring the hydraulic conductivity inside the burrows or, you know, integrating a given um, volume of, of soil? Yeah, so what we're measuring is integrated along our, our well screen. So we have wells that are basically just screened below the water table down however deep they are, which is a few feet. Okay. So we're, we're capturing the kind of aggregate hydraulic conductivity in that zone. It's definitely possible that the, the hydraulic conductivity is higher in the, the shallower portion than it is in the lower portion. We didn't do really work to try and work out what that um, <clears throat> the variation, the vertical variation in hydraulic conductivity is. It, it would be interesting to do, but we just looked at it as sort of an ag aggregate over the zone through which the, the groundwater would be flowing. And the, the, you could see that there was quite a bit of variability in the hydraulic conductivity values. <clears throat> and I, I think that that's because there's variability in whether or not those, or how many burrows each of the wells actually intersects. Um, and so you can get a pretty wide range in hydraulic conductivity, even in relatively homogeneous marsh mud uh, because of, of those burrows. Yeah, great stuff. All right, so listen, it's uh, four o'clock my time. I think uh, unless anybody raises their hand right now, we'll close it. Uh, saying thank you again to Holly. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces and uh, it was a very insightful presentation. So.
uh, great work, uh, Holly and uh, Julia and the whole team in Delaware. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Great discussion. So I see everyone. If anyone wants to hang out here for a bit longer and have a, an informal chat to Holly as the others leave, you know, uh, I'll be happy to leave the room open for a few more minutes. And if Holly is hanging out there and anyone yeah, wants to, to say hello to her um, or create a breakout room, we can also do that. Sounds good. Thanks, yeah. Isaac. Thanks for organizing. Good stuff. So, Holly, have you been to mangroves, you know, applying those models in mangroves with uh, burrows that are like one or two meters deep into the ground? No, but that would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> We, you know, we, we, I saw your, your costs and, uh,